Hello to the friends out in Colorado Springs. This is the voice of Oren Graff, greeting you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and desiring to share with you a portion of Scripture, God's Word, and a few thoughts about that portion this evening. I'd like to read to you from the 13th chapter of the Gospel of John, the first 17 verses of John 13. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And supper being ended, the devil now having put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand, and that he was come from God and went to God, he rises from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. After that he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Peter said unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus saith unto him, He that is washed needeth not, save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and ye are clean. But no, for he knew who should betray him, therefore he said, Ye are not all clean. So after he had washed their feet, and had taken his garments, and was set down again, he said unto them, Know ye what I have done unto you? Ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that ye should do, as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. Thus endeth the reading of the word, the 17th verse. Let us ask our Lord's blessing in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Wilt thou speak to our hearts just now out of this portion of thy word and help us to understand the happiness of which our Jesus spoke about? Help us to know what thou wouldst have us to know from this portion of the word that shall strengthen us and arm us for Christian living and for service that shall be to the glory of his name. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. It is a rather a hard thing to do, friend, to speak to you when I know that you are interested in hearing my voice and what I will do with a portion of God's Word, just as much at least as you are interested in listening to God's Word itself. You know there are so many ways of listening to the Word of the Lord, and most of us, are generally guilty of following the wrong way. Reading the scripture is not just a religious exercise, but we ought to be reading the scripture as a very blueprint for living. You know, we're building a new church here, and the contractor often gets into difficulty because he doesn't carefully follow the blueprint. He doesn't study it to see what he should do. He determines in his own mind what would be the right or the wrong way, and, and then he gets into difficulty every time. You know, it's necessary for us to accept the blueprint 
at the very beginning of the building of our lives and then to follow that blueprint day by day. And God's Word is just that. It's a blueprint for us that we can follow and follow profitably in the building of our lives for Jesus Christ. And so I trust that even though you are interested in my voice and perhaps my way of developing a portion of Scripture or my preaching technique or whatever you want to call it, I really do hope that you may be interested in this portion of word for what God has to say to you through it just now. The theme that I would like to hold before your mind is that of redeeming love. As we have read this story of Jesus washing the disciples' feet. You know, the scripture has various kinds of love in the original language. Various words which are diametrically opposed to each other actually and still they are all translated by the one English word love. For example, there is the Greek word eros which, well, it's the stem for the word erotic, for example, and it means creature love, sensual love, the love of the, of the flesh and of the senses. Then there is philos which means uh, brother love. Or we might interpret it thus, a rational love, the love of man. But then there is another word which is used in this passage today. In fact, it's used all the way through John's writing and most of the time in the New Testament when we come across the word love, it's the word agape, which means God love. There's eros, creature love, Philos, human love, rational love, but agape, God love, or redeeming love, redemptive love. Always in the life of Jesus, when we read of his love, it's agape. You know, that's exactly the kind of love he bids us to have one for the other. Do you remember how he says, that we are to love each other? Well, he speaks of agape. In the story that we read a few moments ago, Jesus washed men's feet. And then he bid us to do likewise. If I then, your Lord and Master, verse 14, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. This doesn't mean, of course, that the Lord wants us to go about washing each other's feet literally because foot washing has an altogether different meaning now than it had at that time. We know that men didn't wear shoes and stockings in those days as they do now. They didn't walk on paved sidewalks everywhere. They didn't ride in automobiles, but they moved about on dusty roads, wearing open sandals. And when they arrived at a friend's house, they took off their sandals and if their friend wanted to honor them, he called a slave to come and wash their dusty, tired feet. There was no servant in the upper room the night that Jesus kept the Passover with his twelve disciples and instituted the Lord's Supper. There was no servant to wash their feet. And so after they were all in their places, our Lord took this task upon himself. The lowliest task that he could do. You know, it's interesting to note in Jesus' life how he always did what he preached. You remember how he preached that men ought to turn the other cheek? And then he did just that himself. He gave his cheek to the smiters. He preached how men ought to go the second mile. And that was particularly galling to the Jewish mind and thought at the time because, you see, there was a Roman law which said that a Roman soldier could requisition any citizen of the country that he might meet at any time, at any place, and force him to walk a full mile and carry the soldier's burden or his bag or his gear. 
And Jesus said, If the soldier forces you to walk a mile, go with him too. That's what he said. That's what he meant. And Jesus himself fulfilled it perfectly because he walked not only the second mile, but as we say yet today in our penal institutions, our penitentiaries, he walked the last mile bearing my burden and yours, my burden of guilt and sin, bearing the cross for you and me. Yes, Jesus walked the second mile. And still he walked. He preached that men ought to love their enemies. And he loved us to the uttermost. Herein God commendeth his love toward us, Romans 5, 8. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. He loved us while we were his enemies. Otherwise there would be no salvation. You see what Jesus preached, he did. He preached that men ought not to seek their own in pride, but that men ought to humble themselves and to do good to all others in a spirit of humility. That men ought not to seek to be the first but the last, not the greatest but the least, not to find their lives but to lose them to humble themselves to be meek. And then Jesus washed the disciples' feet, fulfilling all that preaching in his own life. What Jesus preached, he did. These are just expressions, common everyday expressions, I believe, of Jesus' love for his disciples and for all men. And he says, if I have done these things for you, you ought to do them for one another because I've given you an example. And if you understand this, happy are you if you do these things. These are expressions of his love then. Here's a question for us to ponder a moment. What are our expressions of his love? Do we ever go the second mile? Do we ever turn the other cheek? Do we love those who do not love us? Do we even love the poor and the blind and the, the blind and the hawk? We've just recently come through the Lenten season and past Easter. And each year at this time, we think a great deal of the sacrificial offering, which we call one great hour of sharing. I'm sure you people are familiar with it and, and have participated in this uh, great opportunity of Christians all over the world to share with others who are in need. Now, in our own Presbyterian church, we have about two and a half million members. And last year, according to the record, we loved the poor and the naked and the blind and the hungry. We loved them to the wondrous extent of 50 cents per member. Actually, less than 50 cents per member. We had a little over one million dollars in our offering last year. And we rejoiced because it was the highest offering of its kind that we had ever had in our denomination. A Lenten sacrificial offering, mind you, and it totals to a little less than 50 cents per member. Sacrificial? Oh, dear friends, there isn't a Presbyterian in the United States for whom 50 cents represents a sacrificial offering. You know that. There are very few of us for whom $50 would actually be a sacrificial offering. Instead of $1 million plus, the one great hour of sharing should have been at least ah, $100 million plus. And yet, you know, there's something very remarkable about that gift. 50 cents though it be, God used it and blessed it. 
Over in Korea, they know something about sacrifice there. There are some wonderful Christian people in Korea, and God has purged them and purified them, bringing them through a period of great testing and trial. Hundreds of churches were destroyed in the war. We are building a new church here at Forest and Grove because our church was destroyed in an unfortunate fire not so awfully long ago. And recently we were discussing the borrowing of funds to complete the structure. And the board said we'll pay up to 3% interest. That's per annum, you understand. And we'll borrow the money, you see, so that we can finish the church. 3% interest per annum. In Korea, they tell me that interest rates are 10%. Not per annum, but per month. Why, that would mean that it would be impossible for a Korean congregation to borrow funds to complete their church. But because within 10 months' time, the principal would be doubled by interest, they could never hope to pay it back. So they pay as they go, and they pay by sacrifice. They sell their food and their clothing and the meager furniture from their poor home in order that they might complete the building of their church. This is happening in many congregations. Oh, we've helped with our sacrificial offering, you see. We've helped, and God has blessed that offering. We helped to build 450 churches in Korea, or rebuild that many so far. But you know what one of the biggest gifts that we of America have given? They tell us the mountains of beer cans, empty beer cans, which our armed forces have left behind, are flattened out and used as shingles to rule the church is over there. Have we really loved in the sense that Jesus loved? We have a missionary we support down in Central America where the hurricanes were so bad last fall. Three, the last three hurricanes came roaring out of the Gulf of Mexico and swept across the peninsula of Yucatan in Central America where Fred Passler, a very dear friend of mine and and the missionary supported by this church is working. And, of course, great uh, cities actually were utterly destroyed, and many, many of the churches which have been founded under the mission endeavors of Passler in that part of the world were destroyed, and whole congregations were left destitute. We took an offering immediately in our church here. It amounted to about $570 that we would send down uh, there to uh, help alleviate some of that suffering. But you know, it took months for that $570 to get there, actually, uh, from the time of the hurricanes. It wasn't until in the winter sometime that he received the money. But almost immediately, within a matter of days, he had received $5,000 from our, head, our Presbyterian headquarters in New York. And we had a share of that. You see, that 5000 was in the emergency funds that was left there or placed there from the one great hour of sharing offering a year ago. And so we had a part. And God blessed it. And we could help. I'm sure many of you read the story of the Korean lad who received the only love and expressions of love he'd ever known in his life in an American hospital in Korea last year. And that expression of love which came from you and me and two and a half million other Presbyterians took the form of two iron hooks which they gave to him and taught him how to use because he was an amputee. Both arms were lost. I personally heard Arthur Joyce tell the rest of the story. He was there when it happened. Arthur Joyce of the Department of, of Stewardship and Promotion of the Presbyterian Headquarters. This man 
learned how to love in that mission hospital. His bitterness was taken away. He knew that someone cared for him through the contributions that made possible those two iron hooks for hands. And somehow there was imparted into those two iron hooks that redeeming love that had entered his whole life. And one day, not so long ago, there was a knock at the door, and when it was opened, at the door of this same hospital, here stood the former patient, cradling as tenderly as he knew how, a little fondling child, barely two weeks old, that someone had abandoned along the street, and he had found. There was love in his heart for this little one, and he came to the only place where he knew men cared. You see, his life was changed. Redeeming love had entered his life and was now flowing out through it, and he did the best he could. I had a part in helping that man. You had a part with our meager 50 cent gift. Not long ago, just a few weeks ago, in fact, I heard Billy Graham speak in Chicago, and he spoke on love. He said we ought to make a list of the things that we can do each day to show how we love God and how we can live for Christ, to reveal to others that we do love Christ and for Christ's sake, we love them. It is one thing to be a Christian, he said, but it's quite another thing to live Christ. Or I might add, to live our love for Christ. I have given you an example, Jesus said. I have washed your feet. I am your Lord and Master, and yet I'm willing to wash your feet. You are no greater than I. You are no greater than your Master. He who is sent can be no greater than the one who sends him, and I am the one who gives you marching orders. And this order I give you, as I have washed your feet, wash ye one another's feet. He washed men's feet in love and bids us do likewise. Yet, do we know how to do this? Do we not actually need the power of redeeming love? Do we not need the heart of Christ? How can we love without his heart? Love with his love. I'm sure you understand what I mean. When I have said Jesus washed men's feet in love and bids us do likewise. But now listen to the second statement that I would like to make out of this portion of God's word. Jesus washed men in his blood and bids us do likewise. Now, washing men in his blood, this, you say, is redeeming love, and indeed it is. This is redeeming love, and what is our reaction to it? Here was Peter, the, the leader of the disciples, and notice in verse 8, Thou shalt never wash my feet, he said. Oh, how the pride and the vanity of the human flesh resist the grace of God. We will do anything, Lord, but please don't humble us this way. How we resist the redeeming love of Christ. And yet how essential it is. We're talking about the love of Calvary, if you please. In the second part of that verse, Jesus answers Peter, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Men resist it. I resist it. You resist it. And yet it's essential. 
It's the one essential to be washed in the blood of Christ. And when we surrender to this washing, this cleansing, how men are transformed. Jesus said, ye are clean every whit. You need not wash again, except, of course, the outward dust from your feet. But Peter, in your heart, in your life, you're clean every whit. If I have washed you in my blood. Now I'd like to ask a question, and I, I mean it earnestly. I wish you would try to answer this in your own mind. The love of Christ that was poured out in his blood on Calvary. That love, is it any different from the love of Christ in the upper room? Is there any difference? Let me answer it for you as I believe the answer to be no. In the upper room, Jesus gathered his disciples about him and he instituted the Lord's Supper, didn't he? After he had washed their feet, he came and broke the bread and, and distributed the pieces among his disciples and passed the cup and he said, Now this is my body. And this cup, it, it symbolizes my blood. For my body is now being broken and my blood is being shed for you. For you. It was the same love. The very same love. You ever think of that? And Jesus bid his disciples to go and do likewise. Now, we have a part, therefore, in the redeeming love of Jesus Christ. And happy are ye, he says, if ye do this. Do you remember the story of the rich young ruler, how he came to Jesus? All the things in the law, Lord, I've done them. I've kept them all. What lack I yet? What need I yet to be saved? And Mark says, and when the Lord beheld this young man, he loved him. He loved him with a selfless love that drove him to Calvary. But the young man didn't know anything about love. And Jesus says, young man, there's one thing you lack. Won't you go and sell all that you have and give... Give your goods to feed the poor and come take up your cross and follow me. And was the young man happy at that saying? You remember it. He said, it says no. He went away sad, grieved. This love is great, but it's so humble. It washes feet and souls alike. We are to love God and our neighbor. And this is a godly love. We are to love Christ and take up the cross and follow him. You know what it means to take up the cross? As Christians, we often forget it. It means death. It means hatred. It means persecution. Death. Oh, we are to be ambassadors for Christ. To pray in Christ's stead for men to be reconciled to God. To know the fellowship of his sufferings. Your love and mine. Dear friends, if our love comes from Christ's heart, instead of the human source, then it enters into the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. Not just our preaching, this isn't where our love is revealed, but in our visiting of the sick, in our clothing the naked, in our befriending of the friendless, all in the name of Jesus Christ. Our Lord even commends the giving of a cup of cold water in his name. So often we think that evangelism and Christian service deals with simply preaching of the gospel. We say a mission offering must go to, to pay the salary of the missionary. But did you ever consider the very first mission offerings that were ever taken? Read about them in, in the book of Acts, for example, and, and then oh, particularly in Second Corinthians. When Paul received from his Grecian friends offerings for the destitute people at Jerusalem, was that to pay missionary salary? No. It was to buy food and clothing for people that were starving and naked.
Friends, you will not misunderstand me, I know. I believe that there is no one who can die for sin except Jesus Christ. That there is no one but he who can pay for guilt. Who is the Lamb of God who can take away the sin of the world. I trust him as my personal Savior. I believe that he loved me and gave himself for me. And yet, this portion from John 13 tonight speaks not only to my heart of the love of Christ for his disciples in washing their feet, but of his love for them in washing their souls. And I see it the same love that prompts the foot washing as prompts his going to Calvary. And he says to them, As I have done for you, so do ye for each other. The church is to be a saved society. The church is the society of those who are saved through the blood of Jesus Christ. I believe that. But I believe, dear friends, that the church is more than a saved society. It is also a saving society. And so often I find those particularly who are... Uh, quite confident of their conservatism in the faith, content with the fact that they're saved. They're not restless with the fact that there is a world that needs to be saved. They're not disturbed overly that two-thirds of the world is hungry, that there are men all about them who need the loving hand a kind word of encouragement, little acts of friendship. If we expect to be witnesses for Jesus Christ, effective, we must know how to love. He who loves God loves his brother also. And he who loves God will surely do as much unto the least of these, his brethren, as he will do unto the Lord. Amen. Now I think for a few moments, because there is quite a little of this tape left, I'm going to refer you back to the Old Testament, to the book of Ecclesiastes. And there may I share a few verses with you from the 10th chapter. Ecclesiastes 10, verses 8, 9, and 10, and 11. He that digged a pit shall fall into it, and whoso breaketh an hedge, a serpent shall bite him. Whoso removeth stone shall be hurt therewith, and he that cleaveth wood shall be endangered thereby. If the iron be blunt, and he do not whet the edge, then must he put to more strength. But wisdom is profitable to direct. Surely the serpent will bite without enchantment, and a babbler is no better. Now this last verse is, uh, unfortunately, a poor translation. I think the revised version is much better translation, and all, although I do not happen to have it before me at the present time, it goes something like this. If the serpent should bite, 
before he is charmed or enchanted, of what value is the enchanter or charmer? This may seem like a strange portion of scripture to be using tonight, but I would like to discuss it with you for a few moments, and perhaps this would be a good topic to suggest an axe to grind. An axe to grind. I'm thinking of a story of a village simpleton who was occupied with a very huge pile of wood. He had a poor, blunt old saw with half of the teeth missing and the others absolutely useless that he was trying to use to saw up the wood. And of course, the perspiration was thick upon his face and all over his body, and he was working as hard as he could, but he was making very, very little headway because of the awful condition of the implement that he was using. And the neighbor who wanted to be kind saw the man and, and his problem. He went home and, and brought some sharpening tools, a file and a saw set, and a little vice to hold the saw in. Brought some of these things over and he said, Say, friend, if, if you just uh, let me help you a minute, we'll take that saw and put some teeth into it. And then I believe you will be able to do your work a little better. But the simpleton was not to be caught uh, off guard, so to speak. And the story tells us that he looked at his neighbor and he said, Oh, no, you don't. I'm on to your trick. I've got enough to do here with this big pile of wood without stopping to sharpen the saw. You're just trying to get me away from my work. Well, one of the verses that I read to you, I think, is pretty well demonstrated, or illustrated, rather, by that little story. It's the tenth verse. If the iron be blunt, and he do not wet the edge, then must he put more strength. But wisdom is possible to direct. That simply means that if we would just use good common sense, in many instances, the task would be much simpler. Common sense is intended in the carrying out of our daily task. In fact, there are several tasks which are mentioned here. In the eighth verse, he that diggeth a pit shall fall into it. That is to say, the man who, whose work involves digging a pit had better take heed lest he, he fall into the pit. He has to use common sense and precaution. Or whoso breaketh a head, or that is a, a wall, a stone wall, like a fence, a stone fence, a serpent shall bite him. That's his danger. He better be careful because that's the natural habitat for serpents. We have a quarry less than a mile from, from our church here, and there have been some reports just recently that men have seen rattlesnakes over there at that quarry. They love to, to uh, make their home in such a place as that. The quarry is not used any longer. And so it is that in stone fences. Snakes may make their home, and a man who engaged in tearing apart such a fence had better watch out, unless he be bitten. Or here's another man who's working in a quarry. He's removing stone. There are dangers involved there, and he needs to use judgment and common sense in his path. And any normal man would understand that. Or another man chopping wood. He needs to use common sense in his task. Now that's the last part of verse 9. He that cleaveth wood shall be endangered thereby. Now he use some, some common sense or judgment. And then in verse 10, if the axe is dull, and he will not sharpen it, then what must he do? Why, he has to lean into the axe with twice as much strength. But if he uses his common sense, he will stop a moment and sharpen the axe, 
and put out twice as much work. You have passed the effort. You know common sense tells us these things, and we, we understand them in our daily tasks. But now let's apply these verses to the work of the servant of the Lord, and I don't mean just the minister only, but to every one of us as servants of the Lord. You know, after all, Ecclesiastes is written by a preacher, isn't it? The words of the preacher. And they ought to apply to us who are engaged as ministers or otherwise as servants of Christ. I remember one time hearing a friend say something that uh, stayed with me and, and was a blessing to me. He was a minister and he said, I, I learned never to preach a sermon unless I receive myself a message from the Lord through that passage of Scripture. When God gives me a message and my own heart is blessed thereby, then I can begin to preach and dare to preach from that portion of God's Word. And I'll tell you why I dare to preach from this portion now. Because when I was reading this passage, suddenly this verse stood out and I began to realize that many times the iron is blunt, the axe is dull when I step into the pulpit. And because I haven't spent time sharpening the axe, I've got to put more strength to, as, as the scripture puts it, and that means I've got to pound the pulpit and I've got to raise my voice and I've got to shout to try to get across my point because, well, I have to make up somehow for my lack of preparation. I have to make up with, with a lot of bluster what I lack in spirituality. If the axe is dull and he will not sharpen it, he has to try to make up for the want by laying on more strength. Well, friends, that was the thought that came to me. The Lord blessed my heart with that. I dare not step into the pulpit with a dull act. Nor do you. Your work may not be in the pulpit. But in your everyday task, you know that you have to use common sense. Then in your relationship to Jesus Christ, use that same common sense and be sure that you have your axe ground. For you too have an axe to grind. First of all, I believe that axes are ground through personal commitment to Jesus Christ. In the 15th chapter of John, for example, Jesus says, Abide in me and I in you. And bring forth much fruit. Abide in me. Now, I was about 18 or 19 years old when I gave my life to Jesus Christ. When I made a personal commitment for him. And my life has been different from that time. I know that he is my Lord and my Savior. But friends, I believe that that is not the most important thing in my life. Now that may sound like a shock to you. But if a single day of my life goes by without committing myself anew to my Savior, I'm chopping with a dull axe. When I made a commitment of my life to Jesus Christ some years ago, that meant for me, though I didn't realize it at the time, that every day, every decision I had from that moment on had to be a decision for Christ. A decision for Christian living is not a static thing, but it's a vital thing, it's a throbbing thing, it's a day after day and a moment after moment reality. Axes are ground, axes are kept sharp through personal commitment to Jesus Christ. And that means a constant commitment. Now, such commitment is not possible without personal devotion, is it? I believe we all recognize that and grant it immediately. Axes are ground, therefore, in the second place, through personal devotion. 
We quoted from John 15 a moment ago. In the seventh verse of John 15, you recall is this. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Now there are two thoughts in that verse that seem to me to fit the occasion just now. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, the word of God abiding in us. And secondly, ye shall ask what ye will, that means prayer. Our relationship to the Word of God and our relationship to Him in prayer. This is personal devotion. That we might know the Word. Second Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. Know the Word of God. We are going to have four of the stained glass windows in our new church here at Forest Street. A bare medallions, I think the window man calls them. And, and these medallions will tell a story. That is, the four windows on the, le- on the west side of the church will tell the story. They will, they will describe the word of God. The first medallion will, will picture the open Bible. And coming across the open Bible will be the Greek uh, um, letter sign for the name of Christ, the Cairo. And then uh, hanging from the point of the Chi uh, will be the Alpha and Omega, which Jesus uh, used in reference to himself as the first and the last, the eternal one. The living Word of God. The Word was God. The Word was in God, with God. The living Word of God. That's the first emblem. The second emblem, or a medallion in the next window, pictures the seed being sown. The Word of God is as a seed which bears fruit and grows and thrives in the heart that's open to it. The third window will show the sword, just a naked two-edged sword. And then the last window will show the light. Thy word is a light to me. A lamp to my feet. I would have you think of the word as a sword, a sharp instrument. Sharper than any two-edged sword. In fact, in Hebrews 4.12 we read, that pierces and slices and divide asunder the, even the very thoughts and the intents of the heart. It cuts and it heals. It convicts men of sin. We need to know the word of God. Daily. To be convicted of our sin. To re- reveal our weakness. and then to assure us of God's grace and strength. I believe there is not a single task that God gives his children to do, but what that he will help prepare us for that task through his word. Do you believe that? There is not a single task in your life or in mine, but what God will prepare us for the fulfillment of that task through an earnest study of his word. Where do I get the basis for that? Well, from the word itself. Remember Paul writing to Timothy? 2 Timothy 3, 15. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. Profitable, mind you. For reproof. Review. Correction. And we need these things, for we need them. And instruction in righteousness that the man of God, God's person, may be thoroughly perfect, perfected in all his living for Christ, in every good work, as the King James has. Therefore, Paul says, as he continues writing to Timothy, therefore, preach the word. Oh, we need to know the word. If my word abide in you, 
This will keep the act sharp, friends. If we will let the word of God abide in us richly in all wisdom, and if we will live in the spirit of prayer. Remember in the verse I quoted originally, John 15, 7, You shall ask what you will. Ask what you will. Pray constantly. Pray without ceasing. Pray. We have to work much harder the moment that communion is broken, the moment that prayer is forgotten. Prayer is the keen edge of our act. Oh, how Jesus prayed whenever he had a task to do. For example, when he broke the bread and the fishes and fed the multitude, he prayed, didn't he? You say, yes, but many times he, he healed men and women and, and he was so busy then, surely he didn't pray any teaching. doesn't tell us that he did. No, but it does tell us that he got up while the rest of them were sleeping and went out on the mountains and prayed long periods of time through the night, or prayed all night indeed, that he might renew his strength for the healing grace that he ministered to the sick and the halt and the blind. And then when his greatest task came before him, friends, when he went to Calvary, when the cross was before him, he prayed. He met with God in Gethsemane. You and I must sharpen the act in personal, daily, regular devotions, knowing the word and living in prayer. Then love keeps the act sharp. A while ago we were speaking about love. The love of God revealed to us in Christ Jesus. Revealed to us particularly in, in that little act of washing the disciples' feet. We can turn to our Lord Jesus for the perfect example. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son for us. And he's called us to love one another, to love our neighbor as ourselves. You know, much of the service we render in the, in the name of Christ is done without love. And it's just like swinging a dull axe. Paul told the Corinthians, he says, if I give my body to be burned, if I give all my goods to feed the poor, and I, I just don't have love, I'm swinging a dull axe. It doesn't profit me one whit. Another illustration of this is the great giveaway, progr uh, giveaway program of, of the American government in its foreign relations. We go to a nation that is in need, and oftentimes we say, now we'll send over a shipload of Uncle Sam's grain which he has stored up so you poor people can eat. But now we remember when the Russians come uh, smiling around with their hands out, a handout, remember where you were fed. Remember on which side your bread is buttered. We say in effect, though we don't say it actually, we say, now friends, we'd like to buy your friendship. We'd like to buy your friendship with this load of wheat or with this oil. Now friendship isn't bought. Friendship's given. Just the same as Jesus gave his love, agape love, if you will, to us and for us. You and I must give our love to others. When love grows cold, the axe grows dull. And then I believe there is one other way that the axe is kept sharp. And that's in the keen defenses against the enemy. The eleventh verse that I read here, I would like to call your attention to it again. As I, as I quoted it from memory from the review. If the serpent should bite before it, it has a chance to be charmed, of what value is the charmer? Now, you know, in the East, they, they still have this business of a charming serpent. Doesn't sound like much of an occupation to me, but men still do it. 
and they charm the serpent. I don't know exactly how it's done, but I'm sure of this, that they have to keep both eyes on the serpent, that they have to anticipate every move of the serpent and lead him so that they keep ahead of him in, in every move that he makes. Because if the serpent is not to strike us, then we must be on guard and our charming must be perfect. It must be done ahead of time. The charmer has to be sure he does not make the wrong move or his charming will be of no value. Now just the same, our faith is of no value in this world. Our usefulness to God is practically nil unless we are wide awake Christians unless we are alert to every wile of the old serpent. You know, there's no use to put a lock on the door after old Dobbin has been stolen. There is no value that we are going to be in the service of Christ unless, unless we are going to be on guard and anticipate Satan's move and meet it with the power that is ours in Jesus Christ. You know, if the householder knew which hour the thief would come, he'd be ready. But we do not know. And therefore Jesus said, watch, watch. True to be watching for his coming, it's also true to watch against the power of the thief. The best defensive is a good offensive. We've got to counterbalance every move that Satan makes before he makes it. You know, a soldier or an athlete or a Christian, they all need training and they need preparation for their conflict. You and I, yes, as Christians, we are soldiers for Christ. We are engaged in a conflict, in a conflict with Satan. And the axe needs to be kept sharp. Why sweat with a dull axe? Sharpen your tools. Be on guard against Satan's inroad, that you may meet him with Jesus Christ. In your personal lives, my dear friends, remember, you're equipped to serve, but the axe must be kept ground. It must be sharp.